Uh, welcome to View on Africa. My name is Gustavo de Carvalho and I'm a senior researcher at the Peace Operations and Peace Building Program at the Institute for Security Studies here in Pretoria. Uh, in this View on Africa, I'm going to be talking about the upcoming membership of South Africa in the UN Security Council, starting from 2019 to 2020. We, we have colleagues here in the, in the office and you online, and we're going to have a discussion around what can we expect about South Africa's future role in the UN Security Council, what are some of the expectations for the country, and what are some of the considerations that the South African government would have to have in order to have uh, an effective membership in the UN Security Council. This presentation is based on a paper that uh, the Institute for Security Studies has developed in 2018 uh, with field work in New York in April and May earlier this year and a recent paper that has been published uh, this month. Uh, you will see a link for the paper in the chat box so you can have access to it. So this is the third time that South Africa joins the UN Security Council. The last time was for the period of 2011-2012 and previously in 2007-2008. Uh, South Africa is going to be officially joining the UN Security Council in January 2019, replacing Ethiopia as one of the three African members of the UN Security Council. The other two African members are namely Ivory Coast and uh, 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 Equatorial Guinea. So what is the context of this paper for us? This is embedded within a project at the ISS that aims at strengthening and supporting the strengthening of South African responses to peace and security matters funded by the government of the United Kingdom. And there are three main areas that we would like to present here. First, to discuss around the current dynamics within the UN Security Council and how those dynamics can impact the ability of South Africa to deliver its own strategy and implementation goals. Secondly, and based on interviews conducted in New York earlier this year, what, can, what is expected of South Africa? What are the number of issues that other stakeholders from member states, from uh, academics, and, and those that are following closely the UN Security Council, or what the country can actually deliver? And finally, what can South Africa really realistically expect from its membership in the UN Security Council? And what are some of the considerations the country has to have in the next couple of months in defining its strategy, but also once it joins the Council in January? So when we're talking about Council dynamics, uh, the first question to ask is that why does it matter? Why does the Security Council matter and why does it matter for South Africa in particular? Firstly, it matters because it's still the main organ, international organ, to deal with, with peace and security matters and is mandated, as per the UN Charter, to provide responses and to be able to, to deal with crises and issues as they arise. The interesting and challenging moment right now is that while there has always been questions around the effectiveness of the, the UN Security Council, in the last number of years we've seen an increasing divide amongst its members, especially within the five permanent members, namely France, the United Kingdom, the United States, Russia and China. And while the large divide is seen, especially in what we call the P3, or France, the US, and the United Kingdom on the one side, and Russia and China on the other side, we've also seen an increasing divide within the P3 themselves. We've seen that, for instance, last year in the discussions around the deployments of the ad hoc security initiative in the Sahel, also called the G5 Sahel, when there was a strong division and disagreement between the United States and France on the nature of the deployment, on the nature of funding, and what role the Security Council would play. We've seen, of course, uh, a new role played by the United States in terms of increasingly questioning the effectiveness of the UN Security Council, but also uh, 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 providing open criticism in terms of uh, are pressuring for reduced contributions to peace and security matters, including peacekeeping operations. Uh, 
So all of those, in a way, shape the environment in which non-permanent members like South Africa will see, including on issues that are not so much of strategic interest to all of the members. Uh, a lot of the heated discussions right now in the Council relates to, to, to situations like the one in Syria or Ukraine or even North Korea and Iran to some extent. And while African issues are also often not seen as being so strategic to many members, they historically seen a lot of consensus in them. This consensus is changing somehow. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of debates and heated debates around issues of South Sudan, uh, a lot of heated debates around issues like in the DRC, and less and less consensus seen in many of the situations dealt by the Council. So what is the role of the non-permanent members of the Council? I mentioned the five permanent members, and there are uh, 10 non-permanent members that are elected by the General Assembly annually for a mandate of mostly of two years, sometimes of one year. And while to some extent that divide and challenges around the, the discussions within the Council are very challenging for all of its members, in our interviews in New York and here in Pretoria earlier this year, we realized there is also a number of opportunities for them, especially for countries that have used that divide as an opportunity of bridging uh, 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 the lack of consensus and creating a space somehow to become legitimate and credible voices within the Council. Examples of countries like Sweden or Australia that recently uh, have been in the Council as non-permanent members were often shared with us as countries that have advocated for more effective participation of the Council in, in critical issues, that have tried to bridge divides amongst permanent members and also been able to push for resolutions that could, could not be done if they were being tabled by permanent members of the Council. But it's risky to some extent, as many non-permanent members often use the presence in the Council to place political statements, which does not necessarily reflect on, a, on, on, on some kind of unity in the topics, and to some extent requires a lot of pragmatism from Council members to ensure there is the ability of making a difference on the ground. Council members are elected from their geographical representation. We have three African members in the Council, as mentioned. This year, Ethiopia, Equatorial Guinea and Ivory Coast are the three African members, and South Africa will be replacing Ethiopia from next year. It's an interesting position for South Africa to be from 2019 for various reasons. One, in our interviews earlier this year, there was a lot of concerns around the lack of unity amongst African members, but also a lack of coherence around positions that are presented in New York to those that African members uh, bring in other international organizations, and particularly the African Union. So to some extent, there is a lot of opportunities for South Africa in terms of being able to support the, a more coherent approach from African members, and also due to the fact that most likely South Africa is going to be the most visible country uh, of the African members in the Council from next year. So what are the expectations for South Africa? And that, in our interviews and in our research, has been one of the most interesting cases because there is a lot of expectations. There is a lot of uh, issues in regard to what South Africa can play in the Council as an important African member state, but very much connected to the political developments in South Africa itself. With the change of presidency in February this year, but also the change of ministry and a lot of discussions within the Department of International Relations and Cooperation around reforming and reviewing its own positioning on foreign policy matters, there is many issues that are still to be identified on how South Africa is going to present itself in the Council. Uh, in its campaign documents uh, that was presented before the elections of the Security Council in June 2018, South Africa presented a number of priorities that would be looking to, towards achieving in terms of its own engagement around African issues, including around its own engagements on thematic areas, 
such as peacekeeping, mediation issues, women, peace and security, UN, AU relations, to name a few. But now the question is that what can we actually see the country uh, uh, presenting its own positions and, and developing a coherent strategy in the next two years? So a critical meta that was shared with us around expectations relates to the very position that South Africa plays in New York right now. Uh, South Africa is seen as having been not so visible in the last couple of years on peace and security matters, especially when comparing to the role it once played around 10 to 15 years ago as being a driver of many initiatives and being a key player in many instances within the United Nations. So one of the first expectations for the country is how is it going to utilize the visibility that is going to be gained within the UN Security Council around advancing these issues, coordinating with other countries and being an advocate for African matters in the UN Security Council. A second expectation for South Africa, and I've briefly mentioned that, relates to how South Africa is going to deal with the other African members in the, con in, in, in the council, especially around bringing more coherence, more coordinated positions, but particularly how South Africa can bridge the positions that are placed in the African Union in Addis Ababa to those positions that are pursued in New York. A third issue and probably the most natural space for South Africa within the Security Council is the expectations around South Africa becoming a, a, a visible voice around African issues that are discussed in the Council. Even though I mentioned earlier that African issues are often not considered to be of such of strategic importance to many members, they still configure the largest number of issues discussed in the Council. And having a strong African voice was seen to many from uh, researchers, but also to many member states within the Security Council, increases the weight in those discussions and having those voices really assist in identifying more pragmatic solutions to challenges on the ground. And a final expectation for South Africa beyond the African issues relates on how it will position itself around issues that are not related to Africa. So in terms of how South Africa will deal and position themselves in issues that are very divided, Syria, Ukraine, Iran, that really create challenges around the voting of resolutions, the achievement of consensus and so on. And the reason for that given to us were various. First, there was a sense that South Africa doesn't have the luxury that some smaller countries have of being more absent in global discussions. South Africa is perceived of being an important power, it's perceived as being an important member state, and its voices would be heard in many of those issues. Not that South Africa would be necessarily uh, uh, the definite country in terms of of uh, uh, solving those issues, but certainly would be expected to have clear positions around them. The second reason for that that was given to us relates to the very nature of the Council and the dynamics uh, within, the within the Security Council right now, where it's really difficult to dis disassociate what happens in one issue to the other. Some stakeholders in New York that we've interviewed uh, shared how the spillover effect is, uh, uh, is, is, is affecting many other discussions of less strategic importance, and that's really going to be something to be considered by South Africa in the next couple of years. So what are some of the considerations for the country and what are some of the recommendations that we can, 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 can provide to South African governments and other actors dealing with this? First, relates to its own preparation and prioritization. As I mentioned, South Africa has put forward in, during its campaign around what key priorities would be and what issues they would be pursuing in the Security Council, and I mentioned some of those. Uh, but it's really important to identify how they would fit on a day-to-day -day basis, how its own structures would be able to respond around them, how what kind of advocacy the country will play, not only in New York, but also in other capitals on pursuing those issues, but also how the country will be able to negotiate and to 
form alliances and partnerships with other member states. This is quite important because one of the, the key challenges that some member states that are in the Council shared with us is that very few countries have the luxury of being able to effectively deal with every single issue that is discussed in the country with the same uh, uh, attention. Uh, whilst I mentioned the role of countries as like Sweden and Australia, those countries have often much more resources in their own mission and in their capitals to be able to back a very comprehensive positioning and approach within the Security Council. And these are exceptions. And to some extent, identifying the key issues that the country can effectively contribute to is really important. Another issue that would be very critical for, for them in relation, and in relation to their own preparations and prioritization relates to the staffing of the mission in New York. Missions often increase their presence in New York with new diplomats, but really identifying not only larger numbers, but also having the good quality diplomats that are able to pursue South Africa's position, pursue South Africa's foreign policy goals. One thing that was very clear to us in our interviews is that while having a good number of diplomats in New York matters, having good diplomats is something that enables many countries to punch above their weight. And the individual role that the permanent representative to the United Nations, but also to the, those ones that are going to be dealing with specific topics, is seen of critical importance. But that is also not to be done in, uh, 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 in opposition to having a strong presence and support from its own capital in Pretoria, but also in the embassies that South Africa has in the other member states of the United Nations. That was seen from our stakeholders uh, for two reasons. One, while countries are able to develop their own positions and speeches and be able to negotiate the issues from a New York basis, they have to clear those positions with capital in a very constant basis. And those countries that are not able to create systems that enable the country to be nimble and fast in their approvals often see themselves in, in a disadvantaged position. But at the same time, one of the issues that South Africa was seen of having a strong asset was the fact that it has a very vast diplomatic representation in most countries that are being discussed within the Security Council. So having that information, having that ability of directly relating to its own missions was seen as something very important and really requires a, a, a strong understanding and preparations from its different embassies on how they will be able to support its presence in the Security Council. Another consideration for South Africa relates to how they're going to manage their expectations and communicate in its own positions. As I mentioned, there is a very high expectations for South Africa in the Council and often was seen that if South Africa is not able to timely and effectively communicate why its own positions are being developed and why certain positions were taken in the Council, that it's seen as a missed opportunity for South Africa. An example that was often given to us related to how South Africa positioned itself in 2011 during the Libyan crisis, which wasn't just about uh, a criticism on the position alone, but also a lack of understanding of why South Africa took certain roles. And then I wanted to deal with two final issues, one in relation to thematic areas and the other one around building legitimacy with other council members. Dealing with thematic areas is a tricky matter for any country within the Security Council. And tricky in the sense of many countries use the thematic discussions around peacekeeping or women peace and security or youth peace and security and so on as a matter of building its own profile, but not necessarily bringing pragmatic uh, views and solutions to, to, to those particular thematic areas. 
And while we know and we expect that South Africa is going to be pursuing issues around peacekeeping or UN-EU relations, for instance, it would be of critical importance that the country knows exactly what it can achieve and how it can actually pursue a more effective role of the Security Council in there, so that we're not just debating them, but rather bringing resolutions that have a meaningful contribution to international and peace and security matters. And in that sense, bridging alliances and engaging with other council members, not only on thematic areas, but on specific crises, will be of critical importance. I mentioned uh, quite a bit in terms of South Africa's role in terms of the other African members. But there is a lot of expectation as to well how South Africa is going to deal first with the permanent members that still carry a lot of weight on how the, the decisions are taken and how the day-to-day -day management of the Security Council decisions are done, not only in terms of its own existing relationships with countries from the P3, but a lot of questions were uh, asked around how will South Africa interact with countries as Russia and China, especially on more sensitive issues in relation to human rights, of intervention, and so on. But also acknowledging that the interaction with other non-permanent members, especially those that are going to be joining South Africa from next year, and to be able to pursue a coherent approach that is constructive and pragmatic in, in, in pursuing South Africa's foreign policy. So as, a, as, as it can be seen from my presentation, there, there are a lot of challenges that the country will face. The, the country will be joining the Security Council in January, and there's a lot of work to be done from Pretoria, from New York, from the embassies, and how South Africa interacts with other member states and partners. And we believe that if South Africa presents itself openly that bringing constructive approaches of interacting with its own public opinion in South Africa, but also with a wider community globally, it really can enhance the way in which they, they deal with the Security Council. Next week, there will be an uh, important opportunity for us to see of how South Africa will position itself. South Africa is co-hosting, together with Ireland, the Mandela Peace Summit that was going to happen in the sidelines of the General Assembly. And while it's not necessarily related to its own membership within the Security Council, it really will give a space considering that the legacy of Mandela has played an important role of how South Africa defined its own strategy towards the Security Council. So it's going to be an important event for us to watch and identify what steps South Africa will be taking in the near future.